in the 1850s and 60s, 70s and 1890s. These were perhaps the golden years of Mammoth Cave. There's a very rich and broad cultural fabric to Mammoth Cave National Park. People think of it as a cave and trees and forests, but the human story here is quite extensive and very rich. One of the stories that we celebrate and we continue to, to look into and, and to, to do a better job of telling is the story of the African-American community at Mammoth Cave. They were here from the beginning. First tours of the cave were in 1816, and that's nearly 200 years ago. Uh, many of the first guides of the cave were, were slaves that uh, lived in this area or were loaned to the owners of the cave. Uh, the names uh, Bishop, Bransford, Lively, Garvin, uh, these folks continued working in the cave uh, for generations. Stephen Bishop, uh, quite a magnificent teenager owned by, by Franklin Gorin, one of the sable guides were brought here at age 15. So that's when the tourism started and he leased Matt Bransford, my great, great grandfather from his owner and father Thomas Bransford for $100 a year. And so that started our career here at Mammoth Cave as first generation. Some of the greatest exploration was done by, by some of these folks and Stephen Bishop especially uh, holds the honor of uh, being called probably the first explorer of Mammoth Cave and a very famous guide here. Um, he was the one who, uh, who crossed Bottomless Pit for the first time. He was the one who first went to the underground rivers, to Echo River and River Styx, and found the little eyeless fish that lived there. They were allowed to escort folks from England through the cave, even in bondage. Uh, how the English didn't have the issues with slavery, and oftentimes they were offered to have lunch with the English visitors. They were escorting only the wealthiest, well-to-do folk from around the world, best educated. And we think that's how they actually learned to read and write and leave personal messages in the cave. Because I can find at least three or four Matt Bransford first generation, and there's about 19 of generations of kindred after that, uh, ranging from about 1850 to 1935. Jerry Bransford is a tour guide at Mammoth Cave. After retiring from a 30-year career in private industry, he came to follow in his ancestors' footsteps. Jerry, if I didn't know better, I would think nothing was ever here in this chunk of Mammoth Cave National Park, but this little section has a storied history, doesn't it? It does. If, if you could see old pictures and documentation, you realize that it was several families Families that were white, families that were black, that lived here on Flint Ridge Road. My family was one of the families that lived in this area here, what is now Mammoth Cave National Park, 101 years before this became your 26th National Park. Was once a schoolhouse here. As, as a matter of fact, at one time, just through those woods over there, was a little church named Pleasant Union Baptist Church. So when we go back over through the woods, uh, if you know where to look, you'll find the footer where the school house and church once stood. We had a church, you had a school, uh, what else? Uh, well, Matt Bransford uh, was an interesting kind of a socialite in the neighborhood. He recognized a need at turn of the century, a little bit after turn of the century, that at that time, well-to-do whites would come from around the world to Mammoth Cave and they would have servants of color. Being a very shrewd old businessman, he decided to construct a bed and breakfast for, to accommodate those folks who would come and couldn't stay in a hotel. So Matt Bransford had a bed and breakfast here, and he named it Matt Bransford Resort. Uh -huh. Big swings on the porch, and he'd have social events, and he would put everybody up for a modest fee. The people of color couldn't stay in the old hotel, but then when my father's mother died in 1924, uh, they say whites and blacks came from all over the neighborhood and stayed with, with my uh, grandfather for three days, putting up his corn, taking care of his tobacco, seeing for the kids. You see, by this time, my, my dad, of course, my grandfather was a widow. And so there was clear lines of segregation, but in a lot of ways, this community did quite well for its time in American history, that there were some things that leaked over the boundaries of segregation, and they did quite well as neighbors to help one another. Even at age eight or nine, we had old albums at home, and it would show pictures of some of the early day Mammoth Cave folks, but it seemed like there was a driving desire inside of me to know more than what 
those books told me. I see pictures of people like Ed Bishop and Matt Bransford and my grandfather and his three brothers, but I knew that there, there was probably more back there than I knew. So that started my research uh, in 1975. And my mission is to let folks that know that not only Bransford's of Mammoth Cave played a vital role in, his, in history of the cave, but there were other men of color that were here for a long time and would have stayed longer if they could have. All the men of color, I was told by my great uncle, Matt, third generation, that they were eventually called in in the mid thirties and were told that after the National Youth Park uniform came into place and the government would take over, they'd have no work for the men of color. So I'm, I, feel, I feel as though I'm batting for them. For me, coming here, these folks here treat me like a celebrity, which I'm not. I'll never be a celebrity, don't want to be a celebrity, but it seems like such a reoccurrence that I had ancestors that lost children to slave buyers. I would come here as a preteen and teenager, couldn't come in the restaurant, and now that after I've worked for somebody else 30 years, they actually recruited me and asked me to apply for a job. So coming here is just a pretty awesome experience. I feel like I'm doing some catch up of generations ahead of me, you know? And I'm just honored to be a part of the guide force here.